My first thought on the album Slate of the Grind is still to this day, when I hear the song Monkey Business, it crushes my skull. I have to hold my head in my hands and go, how will you ever beat that one right there? That is a monster jam. I defy you to put that on and not bang your head. <laughs> I also remember Lars Ulrich being in the studio with me when I cut that vocal. And I was literally looking at him going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some shit right now, buddy. And I remember doing that. <laughs> he was like, I go, how is it? He goes, it's, it's roaring. What? It's roaring. <laughs> I don't feel like doing my Lars impression, but we wrote the record in my basement in New Jersey and also our drummer Rob Afuso's house is where we, wrote the album. The song Slave to the Grind, the title track that made the record is actually the demo that we cut. The rest of the record is its, is its own record. And then we tried, we, we did cut Slave to the Grind like in, in that session, but nothing, when you press play, there was something magical about that demo that we couldn't capture for some reason. And when everybody went home, all the band members went home, I was still in LA goofing off, partying a little too much. Michael Wagner brought me to the studio. He goes, okay, this is it, man. Here's the title track. Here's Slave to the Grind, the title track. Here it is, I'm gonna play it for you. This is amazing. I go, okay, man, I'm ready. And you played it for me. And then the song ended and he goes, what do you think? I go, that's good, dude. Still not as good as a demo. He goes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I remember when we showed up for the video for Slave to the Grind, they had a girl there that was in, uh, you know, some bondage outfit, and they had some scene they wanted to film with me in a rubber room, and, and I said, you can send her home now, okay? I'm not doing that. There was two reasons. Uh, one, we didn't want to objectify women because we didn't have to. We did. We, we could do whatever we want. We we could do whatever we want. So we did. We didn't want to do that. That song to us had nothing to do with like a hot chick. It didn't have anything to do with that. Plus, we were with women at the time, and we didn't want to disrespect them. You know. I mean, if I saw my wife now in a video with some dude, I'd have to whoop his ass. <laughs> I remember specifically when I Remember You was a big hit on MTV. We were playing in Daytona Beach and I was uh, walking around on the beach before the gig and two guys were walking around and they recognized me and they started going, I remember you, and like mocking me. And in days previously, I would have tried to kick their ass because uh, you know, in those days, if somebody insulted your band, it, you were expected to beat them up. <laughs> That's the way it was. <laughs> but I didn't, I was like mocking myself with them because I was sick of me too at one point because they played that video so much that you just get tired of something if you see it too many times. So then on Slate of the Grind, we were like, we're gonna show everybody that we can put out a, a rock song and then that's a big hit and Monkey Business was a big big hit radio song. And it was a heavy song for that time. The artwork on Slate of the Grind was done by my late father, David Burke. I have the original painting in my house. It'll look great on the wall of the Hard Rock Cafe someday. <laughs> That's where that stuff goes. <laughs> my dad was a famous Canadian painter who uh, left us in 2002. My dad loved my success, but he loved me being on Broadway more than me being on, in rock and roll. He got scared of rock and roll for, for obvious reasons. It's, it's not the safest vocation. That was the first time recording when I blew out my pipes, trying to hit the ultimate screams. Uh, I was recording this song, Wasted Time, in Florida and it was one of my last vo I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it right. I could only shout. I couldn't, woke up to the sound. I couldn't do that voice. It was like, woke up to the sound. <laughs>
But I was literally, I couldn't sing soft anymore. I had, I had blown that out and, and, and I couldn't, it was just, I overdid it. And so I, and I, I went down to the beach and I walked around the beach by myself. I went to a Howard Johnson's like crying, like in tears, you know, cause everybody's depending on you, you know. And you want it to be over with, for God's sakes. Like, you give it all you got for weeks and weeks and weeks. You're like, can I be done with this? Like, <laughs> but you also have to do it the best you can. And I literally, I couldn't sing it the way I wanted to sing it. And I knew I had to rest my voice, no matter, even if I didn't want to, I knew I had to. So I said, let's stop, Let two, give me two weeks. I'm gonna rest and then get my voice going again. Then we flew to California and then I, I sang it properly. But um, that's, that's what happened. Slave to the Grind, our second record, was the first metal album ever to debut at number one since Michael Jackson's Bad, which had happened in 87. So it was a, it was a big album. And it was the first ever week of SoundScan, which where they changed the process of rating how the chart works to a pure, purely sales-based business model, which meant every record was scanned across the counter. And we debuted at number one on that week. Only one week, though. The next week, NWA came in at number one. And, uh, but we, that was a great week. <laughs> Well, the fan reaction was great, you know. Uh, yeah, we headlined a great tour around the world with Pantera opening up in America, Soundgarden opening up, uh, Nine Inch Nails opened up two shows for us. <laughs> I don't know, they probably didn't want to, <laughs> but they did. <laughs> there was pressure from our label to repeat the success of the first record. But we knew what we had to do. And then we had people in the industry years later say, you guys were ahead of your, like, you knew what you were doing back then because not a lot of bands would have got heavier on their second album. But we, we didn't, we could do what we wanted to do. We had the luxury of being able to do what we wanted. That's what we wanted to do.